Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. Today is February 21st, 2024. Uh, I'm Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society, and I'm here uh, for an individual oral history with Muttley from Billy Club Sandwich, but not only Billy Club Sandwich, as we'll, we'll learn today. Um, and we're going to get into more detail on Muttley's childhood development as a musician, as a lover of music, and hear about um, the 20 bands, at least. Maybe, maybe there'll be more than <laughs> Did I forget remember. one somewhere? 20 maybe. bands that Muttley's played with uh, over the years. Um, so why don't you start off again by just talking a little bit about your family history and background and uh, more about you know, how your family ended up in the Bronx, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, my name is Gary Muttley, mostly known for... Muttley, not my real name, by the way, uh, but I don't use my real name anywhere. Uh, mostly known for playing in Billy Club Sandwich or District 9, but yes, I actually made a list and have played for about, uh, I'm up to 20 different bands I've performed with live over the years, since the early 90s. Um, born and raised in the Bronx, bounced around to a few different places and have been back in the Bronx for years now. Uh, my parents were both born in Puerto Rico. Uh, not sure of the details of my dad's family history. Um, but my parents got married later on. My mother was married previously. That's where my half brother came from, who, who will come into this story, uh, we, my mother came over when she was young with her mother and, uh, with her parents and lived over by Walton Avenue. Oh, okay, okay. And eventually moved around and ended up in the Morris Park section of the Bronx. Uh, my first memories when I was a toddler, we were living on Barnes Avenue just off of Morris Park. And shortly after my brother was born, I was probably two or three, maybe three, uh, we moved over to White Plains Road and Mars Park Avenue, okay. one of the apartment buildings over there across from the firehouse. And that's where I grew up. Uh, I went to school from kindergarten till eighth grade at Our Lady of Solace on Mars Park Avenue. Uh, I was one of those kids, and I know of one other person that did this, and I, I've never, I don't know if this is something that's even still done, but I was actually skipped from kindergarten to first grade. Oh, okay. So I always grew up, like I was always a year younger than all the other kids in my class. Wow. Uh, you know, going all the way through school. Uh, graduated Our Lady of Solace and went to the Bronx High School of Science. So Lady of Solace went to eighth grade? Yeah, then I yeah. See, from see. kindergarten, I was skipped to first, but all the way up to eighth grade, uh, and Our Lady of Solace, of course, isn't there anymore. The building's there, but it's now a charter school. Yeah. Um, both, both the schools, because my brother was in Solace with me, my younger brother. Uh, my older brother was 14 years older than me. My younger brother, who was two years younger than me, we obviously grew up together, uh, he went to Salas, and then after I graduated from Salas for a short time, he went to St. Dominic's, which was on White Plains Road over by uh, Van Nest, and now that's also a public school. So yeah. both those both those schools are gone. Wow. Were there were there very many other Puerto Rican families in Morris Park at that time? Um, it was a mix, but it was definitely more of an Italian neighborhood yeah. back then. Yeah. Uh, it's changed over time, and it's definitely more mixed now. Especially if you go, you know, between White Plains Road and Bronxdale. Yeah. It's a lot more mixed than it used to be. Past Bronxdale, you know, over towards Williamsbridge, is still, there's still a lot more uh, Italian that you can see in, like, the Italian bakeries and, and the other businesses that are over there. But, uh, right. but it's, it's definitely changed a bit over the years from when I was a kid. Uh, because if you went down more towards 180th Street, that was more mixed and a little more Hispanic. Um, you know, but now even the block where I used to live, 
uh, on White Plains Road, Morris Park, a lot of that they, they call it Little Yemen now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so right. you you got you got a lot of Middle Eastern uh, businesses and stuff like that over there, and, and the whole the whole neighborhood has kind of changed as far as the makeup of it. Um, but when I was young, it was a very Italian neighborhood. Yeah. Um, all all the way over. So. Um, and it, yeah, when I was in Solace, it was a lot of Italians. You had a, a mix. It wasn't strictly Italian. You had, you, you know, we had black kids. We had Hispanic kids. We had Asian kids. We had, we had a whole mix. Yeah, so, sure. you know, uh, I guess the thing was really, cause back, you know, with the Catholic schools, you got to pay money. Uh -huh. So... It, it all depended on who could afford to send their kids to the school. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that's right. Um, did you, a, one, one of the things Morris Park is, is you know, I guess um, famous for, uh, for lack of better words, is the Morris Park crew. Did you ever have any run-ins with, with them? No, I, I always heard about them, uh, you know, and, and, and graffiti was a thing back then. Uh, cause where I lived, I lived on a fourth floor apartment in a fourth floor apartment. I would look out my living room window and I could see the two and the five train go Absolutely. by every day. Absolutely. So, uh, I knew kids in school that, that were like into graffiti and stuff like that. And I could just look out my window and see on the trains, you know, I used to see a lot of the big pieces just going by. Uh, you know, so between that and the kids that were into it, like I picked up on, on bits of stuff like, uh, so I would see big pieces by like scene or Dondi, some of those guys, I was never into it myself. Cause I, uh, <laughs> I've never been a visually artistic person at all. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, I'm lucky if I can draw stick figures, but with that stuff, like I was always fascinated by it. Cause like I said, I could see it right out my window. Yeah. Uh, and watch it go by. And that was in the days when you had, you know, I was born in 73. So by the time I started going to school, it was like 78. So like all through my grade school days, like you're, you're in the heyday, like the early seventies into the early eighties was all right. when they were doing full trains. Yeah. Like now they do it, they take it out of service immediately. That's but right. back then, like the full outside and inside of the train was just covered. Yep, and it run and, that way for yeah, a and, very long time. And that's the, just the way it was. So uh, that's one of those old New York things because now people don't understand. Like New York used to be very different <laughs> between that kind of stuff and then just the way the streets were in general. It was a totally different world from what we have now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're there. Um, this is, again, to your point about old New York. We're there like streets or other neighborhoods like that you you know want to go into or you know that you might like catch flack if you went into or that kind of stuff um there were always neighborhoods that you were careful of but just with the way I was and the friends that I had and the traveling that I used to do I used to hang around all over the Bronx okay okay yeah um not so much in the South Bronx, but it wasn't that I was avoiding it. I just didn't really have many friends that lived down there. Sure, sure. Um, but I would hang out, like, around, even around here, around Bainbridge or, or uh, when I was a kid, we, we used to go to Fordham Road a lot. We used to go to Parkchester a lot. Um, you know, and then a lot of my friends in high school lived in Queens. They lived in Flushing or Jackson Heights, so I spent a lot of time out there. But when it came to the Bronx, I was hanging around a lot of different areas. I had friends in Riverdale. I had friends, uh, you know, Pelham Parkway, yeah. even even close to me, like Morris Park, Williams Bridge, Westchester Square, around that area. So so I I spent a good amount of time just in different places in the Bronx. Sure, yeah. And by by the time you went to Bronx High School of Science, were you already deep into music, or is that something that happened? Oh in yeah. School? Okay. Um, yeah, talk about that. Song. Well, I was into music early on. My family was a musical family. My my older brother, who was my half brother, played in bands. 
uh, and I, I once watched a documentary about the early days of Twisted Sister. Oh, okay, okay. From like the late seven, like the early eighties, uh, you know, but like 79, 80, 81, like the very beginning, um, before the records came out and blew up. Yeah. And they played a lot of the same clubs that my brother played oh. around New York, Long Island, Westchester. Uh, there was a place in Yonkers called the Rising Sun uh -huh. that he used to play. Um, that's how he met his wife because his wife's brother was a drummer. Uh, he was a drummer also, but he was mainly a singer. Uh, I think Metallica played at the Rising Sun. Yes. Like 84 and, and I think, yeah, like, like Metallica played there and I think Anthrax played there also. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, my brother Michael was a singer and he was doing stuff like Judas Priest, uh, early Judas. Van Halen. Um, you know, so that stuff was around and, and I got into it eventually, you know, and I'll get there, but also my father was always listening to music and he was into jazz and he was into a lot of Spanish music. Nice. So like Tito Puente uh -huh. and Ray Barreto were his favorites. So he was always playing that stuff around the house and sometimes he'd walk around with a cowbell playing along with it. Wow. And at first I was just like... What is this? But eventually, um, I took a couple of guitar lessons when I was at Solace because it was just something that they, they said, hey, we're going to have somebody giving guitar lessons. And I was like, okay. At that point, I was still young. I was listening to like radio, like pop music. Yeah, sure. Like I was really young. Um, so I was listening to stuff like Duran Duran, um, Men at Work, things like that. Like, I remember Hall & Oates. Like, these are records yeah. that I remember owning early on. Because early on, because my father was into it, my parents would get us records. Okay, okay. So. Um, you know, so I started with stuff like that. But then in grade school, at some point, there were two cassettes that were lent to me and changed everything. Oh, yeah? Wait, and that was Master of Puppets uh... and... Power Slave, Iron Maiden. Okay. Uh, somebody lent me those two, and it was just like, whoa. B blew my head back and was like, what is this? Like, I don't even know what is going on here. Um, so, so that was the start. And also around the same time, uh, my cousins and my grandmother lived in Bayside in Queens. Okay. And they had a house. And in the attic of the house, they basically turned into like a hangout spot. They had a pinball machine, which blew my mind. Like wow. somebody actually owns a pinball machine. Uh, but they also had an 8-track player. Okay. And most of the 8-tracks were up there. It was like Elton John and other stuff. And I was like, eh. But they had two 8-tracks that I'll never forget because this was also what put me on the path. Uh, it was Kiss Alive 2 and Women and Children First by Van Halen. Okay. So me and my brother would go there. We'd be hanging out upstairs listening to these eight tracks. And it was just, again, it was just like, what is this? Like, it was, it was just the start. Um, so I mentioned that I was taking guitar lessons. I took them for a little while. It was just acoustic guitar, listen, yeah. you know, learning on top of spaghetti and, and little stuff like that. Uh, and then I kind of faded out of it. Um, as I started to get into metal through these, these, these three different things between my older brother, because he had records around that was like Led Zeppelin and Rush yeah. uh, and Van Halen. And then my cousins with the eight tracks and then the kids lending me the tapes that those three things all kind of came together and got me into metal. Uh, so, from there, we had a little change because I started to be more interested in the idea of playing drums. Oh, oh okay, okay. And my younger brother was more interested in the idea of playing guitar. So, my parents got me, like, sticks and a practice pad. It was, like, something you can order from, like, a magazine. And they got my brother a guitar. 
And if we want to talk about stores, like music stores, here's, here's the first one. They bought it from Harmony Music, which was on Unionport Road in Park Chester. Ah, okay. If you're going from where I grew up on White Plains Road in Morris Park, yeah. and you go up and you have the split and the two bridges right there, if you go to the left, which is Unionport, shortly before what used to be the Palace Theater, there was Harmony Music, which was owned by uh, two older gentlemen. Uh, and we used to go there and buy records. And they would sell us like the promo copies. I still have a bunch of them. They have a little wow. gold stamp. Like, like I know I've got uh, Doc and Tooth and Nail that I bought from there. And I definitely have some other ones that I bought. I remember specifically buying them from that because we used to go there often enough because we, we would go shopping. Uh, my mom liked to go to Macy's in Park Chester oh, sure, back sure, when sure. it took up the whole block. Yeah. Uh, and, and we also would go to the movies. Yeah. Cause, cause I, even to this day, I'm still a movie theater person. Like I, I, I like movie theaters. So you had three movie theaters in Park Chester. So we used to go to all three of them, the circle, the American, and the palace, and I it, countless movies seen between there and Fordham Road. Sure. So used to get a lot of records from Harmony Music, and they bought my brother a guitar that was in the window of Harmony Music, which was a, a, a cheap Explorer style. Uh, Memphis was the brand, uh -huh. and I'd never seen another one until recently. I had a back and forth on Instagram. Eric Peterson from Testament posted a picture with a Memphis guitar. And he's like, I don't think I've ever seen another Memphis guitar. And I was like, dude, I had a Memphis That's guitar. Wild. And he was like, no shit. Um, so they got him that guitar and I had the sticks and the practice pad. And eventually we did. And the Van Halen brothers did this too, if you know the history. Because originally Eddie was going to be a drummer. Yep. And Alex wanted to play guitar. And they switched. And me and my brother, Chris, we switched. Suddenly, I started playing his guitar more. And he started messing with the drumsticks more. Uh, so I picked up that Memphis guitar and started playing it. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was in. I was hooked. Um, and over that time, you know, and that was right before, like, I started going to high school. So, like, kids... At Solace, we're trading other tapes, so I started to get into other stuff, and then I just started reading. Like along with that, I started reading guitar magazines. Oh, sure, sure. And I was reading guitar magazines, but then I was also reading these other metal magazines like Circus and Hit Parader, and I was just absorbing all of it because I was, I was into music from early on, and now I was just all in. So like here I am, reading all these magazines, looking at all this stuff. I'm like buying records because. There was no YouTube. There was no Spotify. None of that stuff. If it's not on the radio, you're either hearing it from somebody either telling you about it or lending it to you, or you're just taking a chance, which I did many times. That's right. Just buying stuff. I don't even know what it sounds like, but I remember reading about this in, a, in an article in Circus, so I'm going to buy it. So all of a sudden, I'm into Rat. I'm into Dokken, but I'm also into heavier stuff like Overkill. Yeah. And stuff like that. Um, and that was how the path started from that guitar from Harmony Records and going from there. Uh, then, as like right around the time I went into high school, they opened a store in my neighborhood. And it was only open for maybe two years. Okay, what store was that? Uh, it was called Vasco Sound. And it was on... And... and, and I'm telling you now, if anybody out there remembers this store, put a comment or whatever, because I'll be shocked if anybody remembers this place other than me and my brother. Um, it was on, I, it was on Mars Park, and I feel like it was, uh, it was the south side of Mars Park, like near Wallace, I think. Okay. Between Holland and Wallace. Uh, it's now two separate stores. Um, and it was only there for, like I said, like two years. Uh, the owner's name was Joe Vasco, which is where Vasco sound came from. And since it was the neighborhood store, we used to just go there and hang out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I bought a guitar from there. I bought my first bass from there. Wow. Uh, and they used to have a room in the back, a rehearsal room. Yeah. So me and my brother would go there with the kid who was our next door neighbor on White Plains Road. And we would just go and fuck around for two hours. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. But we were just like, fuck it. We, uh, we like, can make noise. Uh, Let's yeah. go. Uh, I also took a few lessons from the guys there because Joe, the owner, w gave bass lessons. And there was another kid named Mike there who used to do guitar lessons. I took a couple of lessons there. Um, and we that was just the neighborhood. Hang they sold records wow. also. I remember buying... Uh, Ozzy Osbourne, No Rest for the Wicked. Oh, I remember okay. buying in that store. And I definitely bought other records that I can't remember. But they sold some... But some they nice sold... Stuff, yeah, huh? they sold records, but then they also sold, like, music gear. Uh, so, you know, I bought... It was my third guitar I bought from there. It was a BC Rich. Because uh, I had that in Memphis, and then at some point, uh, my parents bought me a Kramer from Sam Ash in White Plains. And then... Uh, and then the BC Rich came from there. And I also bought my first bass, which was a Red Dean bass. Uh, um, okay. Because I had read something, uh, I think it was Joe Satriani talking about playing bass on his own records. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. And I was like, you know what, maybe I'll try bass. Let me give it a shot. So the bass was like 125 bucks or something. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, let's... Let's do it. And, I, and I, I started playing, I was playing guitar, but then I also started playing bass and I was back and forth with both, to, which I still kind of am to this day. Um, but yeah, Vasco Sound was the neighborhood place, so that was the regular hangout. Um, and then they closed. So and I, and I was devastated. They were open, what, 87, 88? It was probably a little later. It was probably like 89. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Like, it was right around, well, I was in high school at that point, but yeah, it was like 80, 88, 89, maybe into the beginning of 90, but yeah. I'm not even sure. That's um, Because, I mean, if we look up when No Rest for the Wicked came out, that, that'll give us a, a basic range. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one day they were just closed, and I was just like, oh no, what am I going to do? Because uh, at that same time, while I'm in high school... Kids are trading tapes, and that's how I got exposed to a ton of stuff, uh, because uh, I always tell the story. There was tape that uh, this kid gave me that was Fate's Warning on one side, NWA Straight Outta Compton on the other side. Wow. And I love Fate's Warning to this day, but I wore the shit out of Straight Outta Compton. Yeah. Because uh, that was just mind-blowing. Uh, and that's how that that tape trading was how I got into a lot of stuff. That's how I discovered Carnivore, uh -huh. you know, a lot of the crossover stuff, Carnivore, DRI, um, Cro-Mags. I think Born to Expire was in that mix. Definitely Agnostic Front, Murphy's Law, um, you know, but then a lot of a lot of the heavier stuff like like Overkill I was into, Testament, a lot of the thrash stuff. Uh, you know, coming out of California. Yeah. So that was how I got into a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, and then also, like, I was always into a lot of, like, the progressive metal stuff. Like, I mentioned Fate's Warning, but, like, sure. Queensryche, Crimson Glory, bands like that. I was always into that stuff, too. And that came from, I think I mentioned my brother had Moving Pictures by Rush. Yeah. So it was like, that was kind of in that direction. So I was getting it. You know, it was all, the whole stew was brewing. Um, was your older brother still in the musical? He stopped completely. Yeah. Uh, he decided to dedicate himself to work. Uh, and and it wasn't until much later, because he passed away years ago. Um, only a couple of years before he passed, he started to get back into music. He, you know, I don't know if he realized that. He had missed it, um, and he, he started to get back into it. But but he definitely 
started singing again. He had a drum set set up in his house again. Wow. He had stopped doing it for many, many years, like wow. 30 years at least. And then in the last few years of his life, uh, you know, even before he, he got sick, uh, he started getting back into it. Wow. And, and and he had perform. He, he was out performing once in a while with uh, with his wife wife's cousin. He had a, a cover band that he did that that was pretty popular and did a lot of gigs. And that was another thing. Like I mentioned, my brother like playing all these clubs and stuff like that. I'm a little kid. I'm hearing these guys talk about all these stories about Richard Blackmore uh -huh. and, and and all these other guys and and. And I'm just a kid just absorbing all this stuff and I'm hearing this stuff. And it's like that kind of started the spark of like me wanting to play and eventually wanting to play live. Um, so Vasco Sound closed. I was out of commission for a while. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a local store. I was still playing. But I didn't play out. Like when I was in high school, I jammed with a couple of different people. Um, and I think it was January of 1990, I performed live for the first time. Oh. Uh, it was at Horace Mann High School. At Horace Mann High School. Yes. Wow. So. Like a talent show kind of setup? It, 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 it was like kind of, yeah. So here's the setup because it's crazy. So, in high school, I had a first period electronics class. Yeah. Sitting next to me is this kid, Jason, who was known around the school because he played drums for the jazz band at school. Really good drummer. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially for, you know, 16 we were, 15, 16. Um, one day on Monday, we're in class, and he's like, hey, so... I got this band and we're supposed to play on Friday. We're playing like there was some kind of benefit for homeless, for the homeless. And, and it was at Horace Mann. And like they had a bunch of different people, like, like you'd have this group do like two songs and then the next group would do like a couple of songs. So they had this thing all set up already. And one of their guys flaked out at the last minute. And he's like, Hey dude, I know you play guitar. Cause like, Sometimes we'd hang out in the auditorium and mess around. Like I probably brought, like somebody would bring a guitar and then I probably messed around a couple of times, like yeah. just on a, on like a, a free period or something, hanging out in the auditorium. So he's like, I know you play guitar. Like, uh, we got this gig and like our guy just flaked out. You think you'd be able to do it? And I was like, Yeah, probably. When's the gig? It's Monday. He's like, Friday. And me being crazy. And I just never, I'd never been on stage before. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? Let's do it. So we're doing two songs. It's Tom Petty, Free Fallen. Okay. And I Remember You by Skid Row. Okay, all right. And I got to play the guitar solo on the Skid Row song. Oh, and I'm not like... Back then, maybe I could have pulled it off. Now, like, probably not. But, like, back then, like, with all the guitar magazine stuff, I was sitting there and, like, practicing all the time. Yeah. I was like, eh, maybe. I was like, fuck it. Let's do it. So we practiced Tuesday, Wednesday, and then played the show on Friday. <laughs> uh, and I'm just this crazy looking metal kid with like a trucker hat. And like <laughs> everybody in the band is completely different. Like yeah. the singer's like an Asian girl. The bass player's like a tall dude whose favorite bands are Depeche Mode and Queensryche. And then Jason, the drummer, is just, you know, kind of crazy. We pulled it off. Wow. And I was just like, wow, this is... This is wild. Like, that was my first live experience. Wow. You know, I went from sitting in my bedroom all day from when I get home from school, playing along with Injustice for All all night, <laughs> to, like, actually performing. Uh, and and they filmed the whole thing. To this day, I've never seen the footage, so I have no idea really? how good or bad it was. Nice. Um, 
but that was that was my first taste of it, and I was like, ooh. So is that is that do you include that with the twenty? No. You, yeah, because I, I, no. I probably didn't even have a name for that. No. Or anything, right? No, it was just like a random thrown together thing, and yeah. other than Jason the drummer, I never saw anybody else in the band again. Wow. Uh, you know, no, nothing bad. It's just yeah, like sure. we didn't really keep in touch. I didn't really know them like he knew them. Uh, it was just one of those really totally random things. Boris man, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and then after that, I, I was playing. Uh, eventually, I, I got a job. I started working uh, in Throg's Neck. I was working at a supermarket on Tremont Avenue. Okay, yeah. And I know the four of the chamber guys mentioned this place, Schuylerville Music yep. in Tremont. Uh, I took some guitar lessons there because it was practically right across the street from the from the, uh, the supermarket where I work. I took some lessons there. I bought a guitar from there. I used to buy a lot of strings and stuff from there because I was there a lot because I worked right across the street. Yeah. Uh, so that was another place when it comes to like music store, like instrument stores. It was like that. That was uh, that was a big one. Uh, because I took lessons from Willie Genovese, who I believe Will Romeo from Enziguri and Nexcars also took lessons from him. Oh. So it's a small world, <laughs> um, which I didn't know. And then some one day we we're randomly talking and like mentioned Skylerville. And I was like, yeah, I used to take lessons there. And he's like, from Willie? I'm like, yes. That's funny. <laughs> so, and, and like I said, the four in the chamber guys were talking about that store on yep. on on their interview. So it's like small world. Um, and by the way, it, it, switching from instrument stores to record stores, the record stores from when I was a kid that I went to a lot. Uh, I mentioned Harmony Music, but I also it, my mom would take us a lot to Fordham Road. Between the two movies that were over there, there were the Fordham and the Valentine. There was Gorman's. We used to get hot dogs all the time. Uh -huh. We used to go to Alexander's. And I remember definitely buying many records from the Crazy Eddie that was on Fordham Road. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I know I bought an Accept record from there. I think I bought a Rat record there also. Definitely remember the Accept record. Um, so, you know, that, that's another random place in the mix and also uh i'm pretty sure actually the first record that i ever bought because i'm crazy like this i'll i can actually tell you the first r record cassette and cd that i ever oh, bought wow. with my own it. money yeah uh i believe i bought it at that crazy eddie it was ride the lightning oh okay 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 the first cassette that i ever bought which is actually the first thing I ever bought with my own money. At the same time, I bought Iron Maiden, Maiden Japan EP, and uh, Power Slave. Okay. And the first CD I ever bought, I bought in, I think it was Caldor on Bruckner Boulevard, because we're talking about this off camera, like that, that building that was last Kmart was a Caldor before that. It was TSS, I think. It might have been Corvettes. Like, it went through a bunch of different names. And I think it was a Caldor at that point. And I bought the first CD I ever purchased was from there. And it was either Caldor or TSS at that point. And it was Flotsam and Jetsam, Doomsday for the Deceiver. Oh, wow. Okay. Um. So, I, I, you know, being a music guy like I am, like, I've always been so into it. Like, I remember stuff like that. Um. But yeah, so after playing that live show and then working at the supermarket for a while, uh, some friends of mine that were from high school uh, and like a group, there was a group of friends. It was like one or two guys from high school and then their friends. Uh, one of those guys was going to high school of art and design in Manhattan and they were having a battle of the bands. Uh, which reminds me, I'll go back to another Battle of the Bands thing from the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, it was not far off from this. Um, so my friend's like, hey, 
Maybe we should put something together. And I'm like, okay, sure, let's do it. So we ended up performing two Battle of the Bands, doing mostly covers. Like I think maybe we did like one or two original songs, but we did like Faith No More. We did, uh, there was a band called Mind Funk. Mm. We did Alice in Chains. Okay. We did Jane's Addiction. Uh, we did all that stuff. Side note, talking about random connections, uh, one of the people that was that went to that high school, well, two, two other people that went to that high school with my friend Tom, one was Rich Hall, who ended up booking a lot of shows at CBGB's. Okay, yeah, yeah. The other one is Hank Belfour, Henry, who plays bass for Inhuman and now plays bass for Sheer Terror also. Yeah. Uh, he had a band back then called Brutal Submission that played... Uh, you know, so random connections all over the place that always bring it back. Um, so we played that a couple of times, and then we decided to keep going as a band. We had a couple of different names. At one point, we were White Noise. It changed over time. And, like, the first live club gig I ever played was with those guys. Oh, okay. uh, and it was actually at the Bond Street Cafe, which ended up being, like, a major hangout for me later on. Uh, and we were doing a, we were more of like a, a rock band, like Faith No More, Jane's Addiction kind of thing. wasn't wasn't a hardcore band. Um, oh, and you you were playing and guitar I was, or bass? no, I was playing bass. Oh, you're playing bass. Okay. Um, and we played there. We played a couple of other clubs and stuff like that. And then the band kind of faded out. They decided they wanted to go in a different direction because some of them were. were they were thinking about going like more in a goth type of direction because uh, they see. were into that stuff. Because I think we covered like, it might have been a Sisters of Mercy song. I can't even remember what song it is. Uh, but then they wanted to kind of go lean in that direction. They knew I wasn't really into that. So yeah. so they, they kind of ended that band and basically started the band up with a different bass player and, and like a different direction. And I was fine with it. I was still sure. friends with everybody. It's like it, it wouldn't have been my thing anyway, because I'm not I'm not into the goth stuff really. So so that was that was that. Um, back to the battle of the band stuff. Ninety one. I'm at Lehman College doing college radio. Uh, and I had gone to a battle of the bands at Columbus High School. Uh huh with the next door neighbor that we used to jam with sometimes. And, uh, and I always heard about these battles at Lehman high school, but I never went. And I'm at college radio. And one of the guys that works with me at college radio, uh, is filling in for a band that's playing at studio one in Jersey. And he's like, Hey, we're renting a bus to go from Lehman. You want to come with us? Uh, so I'm like, yeah, sure. So I go, end up hanging out on the bus with all these people. Didn't really know anybody other than than Rob. Uh, meet a bunch of these other people. Uh, the band that he was filling in on drums for was called Violent Carnage. And the bass player is Dave Mitchell from Four in the Chamber. So I met him for the first time um, and then talk about Parallel Paths again. Rob's brother had a band called Requiem doing college radio. Those guys started coming, hanging out at college radio. Um, and all of a sudden, like those guys are popping up on my radio show, uh, just hanging around and also... I would go see them live. I saw them live a bunch of times. And when I was at Lehman, we booked, we decided to book a metal show. And we did it in the cafeteria. We borrowed like staging from like, you know, the, the stage department people and like lighting and stuff like that. And we actually managed to pull off like a decent metal show. Uh, it was only three bands. It was a band called Nervous Wreck. It was Requiem, who were from Drowsneck. Uh, and the third band was a band called Smokescreen. Oh, 
they're like and, oh, Westchester. Yeah, like it was it was guys from the Bronx right? and Westchester, yeah. and they were more progressive metal, like Queens Rite type of stuff. Oh, G-Man, right? And their drummer was G Man. Right. Which I didn't find out until many, many years later when I was randomly like you know, when you have dead time at work and you're stuck in like a a Google hole uh-huh, and you're uh-huh. just searching random stuff and all of a sudden somehow Smokescreen came across because I think I was looking up something about some other band. Uh, and all of a sudden it's like drummer of Smokescreen was Gary Sullivan, G-Man. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I had met G-Man many times when he was playing with the Pro Mags. And, uh, and then I talked to him about it when we played together in Belgium. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, you play for a band called Smokescreen? I was like, do you remember playing in, in the cafeteria at Lehman College? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I booked that show. Wow. <laughs> and here it is, two Bronx guys talking about a show from like 30 years ago <laughs> while we're standing around at a festival in Belgium. You know, it, it's the craziest thing. You know, the dude from Mars Park and the dude from Co-op City just hanging out, chilling in Belgium. Yeah, that's... No wow. big deal. <laughs> Was Nervous Wreck also from the Bronx? They were from I've the Bronx. Before, they... Yeah. they I met them because somebody told me about them and then and then brought me to their apartment. They had like a basement apartment and they practiced in there. Oh, uh, okay. And it was somewhere over on Jerome Avenue. Yeah. Um, not that far from Lehman College. I see, I see. Because I ended up jamming with them once or twice at their house. You know, I'm this young kid, doesn't know anything. And they're like, yeah, hey, yeah, come jam with us. We'll play some Slayer songs or something. And I'm just hanging out with these older dudes just jamming. Because I was probably like 16 at 17 at the time. Yeah. Um, so that was crazy. Um, but yeah, that's where those guys were from. And then I think I think they ended up actually playing. Like I think I ended up seeing them play live once or twice at like the Ritz or something later on. Um, and Requiem was out doing stuff. Smokescreen I never got to see perform again. That was the only time I saw them. Wow. Um, but yeah, again, just random connections that come back later on so the requiem guys would hang out also uh there was a guy who was a drummer that used to hang out at at the lehman radio station because he was friends with somebody that was there and he had a band called broom helda ah, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh him and his brothers had a band called broom and and he used to hang around at the station sometimes i think his brothers came through a couple of times and then uh laz the bass player went on to play in el nino which he's still doing now but it's all, again, you know, random connections. Like, some of us have been doing this for, like, 30-plus years at this point. Yep. Um, so that was crazy. So going back, White Noise Stops, or whatever we were calling ourselves, because, like I said, we went through a couple of names that I can't even remember, obviously. And I was just going to hardcore shows yeah. all the time. Um, trying to think. I started working at Tower Records okay. downtown, and that, like, that's a whole thing in itself because I got hundreds of stories from working at Tower Records. Yeah, you do, yeah. Oh, because it, it was in the Village, so like, again, talking about old New York, like it was in the '90s, so it wasn't like total lawlessness like we were talking about, like in the '70s into the early '80s, but. That whole area, the East Village and like the Lower East Side is completely different from what it is now. Yep. Now it's all nice restaurants. Back then it was a lot of squats and a lot of crazy stuff. Um, you know, not like worrying about getting shot, but it was definitely not like it is now. Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time there. Like, And when I wasn't working there, I was going to shows down there. Uh, I was at the Bond Street Cafe like every weekend, hanging around you know, with my friends that were playing in different bands, or if we weren't at Bond Street, we were at Wetlands, or we were at Coney Island High when that started up. So we were all over the place. Uh, you know, when the Limelight was doing shows, there was so much stuff happening, because I was doing that, but I was also going, I started, when I was in high school, I started going to arena shows. Sure. Uh, and then started going to club shows, you know, in the early 90s, and then was just, I was doing something, especially when I worked at Tower, because I would get into a lot of stuff for free. Yeah. Because I was able to get tickets through different people. Uh, I was at shows like every, like once or twice a week. Wow. Wow. And with the, with the 
club shows, were those mostly hardcore, or were you still going to... Oh, I was going to different stuff. Like, I saw a lot of metal shows. Yeah. Like, I was going to... A, like, the first big show I ever went to was in 1988. It was the Monsters of Rock Tour at Giant Stadium. Yeah. That was my first show, period. But then, within a month of that show, like, maybe even three weeks... I also went to David Lee Roth at Madison Square Garden uh-huh. and Iron Maiden with Ace Freely at uh, what was then the Brendan Byrne Arena, which became Continental Airlines and then Izod Center, and it's now empty. Yeah. Um, you know, but the Meadowlands, basically. So, like, with those three within a couple of weeks of each other. Wow. And I was just going. Like, I used to go to concerts all the time. My parents would buy me tickets and, like, drive us there and they they used they used to have this thing called the quiet room where the parents could go hang out and wait for the kids to get out of the show so like yeah. my parents would actually go and do that like my parents were cool about wow. it. um they you know they they were always supportive of of like with the music stuff because like i said they were buying me guitars and stuff like that uh did they understand it no like you know they'd make fun of it like eh, you know Kill your mother, shit. But <laughs> but they were always supportive of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were never like, no, don't do that. And they were never like anti. Like when I was really young, they got a little weird about some stuff, like especially if they heard like cursing and stuff like that. But eventually over time, you know, it was inevitable. Yeah. And by the time you started having parental advisory stickers and stuff like that, it was already, I was already deep into it. For it was, sure. It was For too sure. late. Um, but yeah, I started going to arena shows, and then I started going to a lot of club shows, and I was back and forth because you had those in-between shows at places like Roseland or the yep. Academy, so I would go to those shows, uh, you know, but then I, I got to be friends with, uh, well, let's go back. Going to shows like Roseland, you're on the two train, going down. See a kid in a Pantera shirt or Sepultura shirt or something. Like, hey, he's going to the show. All of a sudden, you guys start hanging out. Yeah. That's how I met Martin and Barry. Uh-huh. When they were doing Go to Mentis. Or even might have even been before they were doing Go to Mentis, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, there was a whole group of kids going from the Bronx down to shows in the city. And you're on the train. It's like, hey, you're going to the show. Yep. You just see some metal shirts, and it's like all of a sudden everybody comes together, and and all of a sudden that's how that whole click came together. Like the Go to Mentis guys, and like uh, that's how I met Mike District Nine. Sure, sure. It was all it was all part of that. That and and we go to shows. I go to see a show at Wetlands. Uh, I don't remember who else was on the show, but without a cause was playing. Yeah. And some of the other guys, I'm, I'm missing part of this, but I'll go back. Uh, some of the other guys are like, oh, hey, we're friends with these guys. I'm like, the bass player is Dave Mitchell, who I met back at the bus trip. End up talking to him again. This is his band now. So I meet the other guys like Lenny and Frank. And then we're we're all friends. Yeah. Uh Let's go back for a second because I missed one part. Yeah, sure. When I was doing college radio, there was another guy who was hanging around the radio station. Uh, his name was Tito. And he's like, hey, you know, uh, me and my friend are just jamming. Uh, you know, we don't have a bass player, so why don't you come jam with us? And, uh, and his, his friend was Don, who was the drummer. And we ended up having a few different people sing at different points. But we never, like, we were practicing in an apartment over by Grand Concourse, not yeah. far from Fort Worth. Uh, but I guess nobody gave a shit about the noise. <laughs> Go figure. Um, better than gunshots, I guess. Yeah. Because <laughs> that, that neighborhood was a lot crazier. Um, that group we never played live but basically that was the beginning the early stages of what became driven by hatred i see I so see. 
I was hanging around a lot with those guys, with Tito. Uh, we had a guy that was singing with us for a little bit named Angel, who is still a good friend of mine to this day. Uh, we call him Angel the Cop because he became a cop. He's now a retired cop, and he lives down in Florida. Um, but Angel was the one that got me the job at Tower Records. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so okay. it's all... Wow. It's all tied together. But yeah, those guys, uh, we never played live. Like We never even thought about it. We were yeah. just jamming, just fucking around. But eventually, Tito and Don with some other guys, because we kind of just lost touch after a while. Those guys eventually started playing live, and they were driven by hatred. And one day at the train depot, I'm like, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. What are you doing? He's like, yeah, we're playing. I'm like, oh, you're playing? Okay. And Driven by Hatred is playing the show. And, wow. Uh, so, because like I said, we had just kind of lost touch. You know, that was the days of, there was no Facebook, there was no MySpace, there was no, like, unless you're calling somebody or or calling their pager, Yep. it was easy to lose touch with people unless, you know, you lived like down the block. So, you know, we lost touch over the years and then, and then ran back. Were, were you, um, before you gone, were you part, or did you ever go to any of, like, the early house party shows that were going on? Because I think Tito, I haven't recorded with Tito yet, but I remember him talking about, you know, he's one of the people who's spoken about the house Yeah, I, I probably went to one or two. I can't really remember which ones. Yeah. Um, I didn't go to a lot of them. Yeah. Because what ended up happening with me was that when I started working at Tower Records, like, that was my base. Like, I was sure. always down. I was always around, like, the East Village, the Lower East Side. Like, I knew the guys from the Bronx and would hang out sometimes, but most of my hanging out was downtown. Yeah, because like even Because if they had extra hours, I was working. Because yeah. I loved working there. Uh, I worked there for, like, four or almost five years. Wow. Um, and... If they had extra hours, I was always working. So sometimes I was working like six-day weeks. Wow. In the holidays, sometimes seven-day weeks. And then because, you know, I wasn't uh, old like I am now where, like, I could go do that, then go to a show, drink, then wake up the next morning, go to work, do, <laughs> do the same cycle over and over. Now it's like I have one drink. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I feel that. out of gas. But, like, back then... You know, it, it, like, I started working there. I wasn't even 21 yet. Uh, so that was, like, my early 20s. So I was just, like, wow. out, out. Like, I, I was out all the time. I was going to shows. Like I said, I was going to a couple of shows a week. Like, between, like, club shows, like Bond Street or Wetlands or Limelight or, or the bigger places like Roseland or the Academy or Irving Plaza. And, like, I was just out all the time. Were you still living with your family in, in the yeah. market? Yeah. Uh, my dad had passed away mm -hmm. uh, right after my first year of college. So it was me, my younger brother Chris, and my mother still living on Mars Park. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and I was just out all the Because, listen, I was working, so I was I was making some money. And I just wanted to go hang out. Like, And I wasn't, I wasn't even really playing in bands for a while i was just out at every show like wow. quicksand's playing the academy i'm going uh pantera at roseland i'm going uh small you know small shows like i i saw a uh, close call at the underworld which was corner of bleaker and broadway um i don't even remember who else played that show but like wow. that was one of the that was a show where like I was always hanging around downtown, but it was a bunch of Bronx bands. Uh -huh. So, like, all the Bronx dudes were all hanging out. Um, and shows like that and uh, Bond Street all the time. We were at Bond Street, like, every week. We didn't even know who was playing sometimes at Bond Street. And yeah, we would just, just go. go. Yeah. Because um, sometimes it was somebody we knew. Sometimes it was somebody we didn't know, but it didn't matter. Because that was also how I found out about some other bands. Like, yeah. you see, uh, like... I think VOD and Candiria played the same night at Bond Street. Back when both bands had no bass player. 
Um, you know, it's like, who are these guys? I don't know. They're from Long Island. Like, yeah. Check them out. Yeah. And then, huge, huge fan. Um, so I was, that, that became my home base. So I didn't hang out in the Bronx as much. I was always down there, but a lot of, a lot of the Bronx people would come down there to yeah. see shows. So, uh, you know, so I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, for a short time in the nineties, literally, well, I'll say it's a show and a half. Uh, I was bugging Mike to try out for District 9 because yeah. they were looking for a guitar player. And he's like, all right, come down. I go to the tryout. Sounds great. After the tryout, Fahrenheit is playing at CBGB's. And they're like, oh, let's go to the Fahrenheit show. And then while we're at the Fahrenheit show, all of a sudden, like, Mike Todd is like, because uh, Todd used to work by me, so I, I, I would hang out with Todd a lot. Uh, one of them is like, hey, you want to do two songs? Like, I just tried out for them a couple of hours before. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> so we did So we did two songs. Uh, after that, we played one full set at Wetlands. And then we stopped. Wow. Because uh, if you know the history of District 9, the band start, started and stopped a uh -huh. few times uh -huh. uh, for different reasons, you know, different people. Like A lot of times the lineups were different because I... I I ended up back in the band many years later uh, when Lenny was in the band. But they've, they've gone through a bunch of different lineups over sure. the years. Uh, so I did that for a short time, and that was probably 96, maybe. Uh, before that, in the Bond Street days, I had another band called Antagonizer, and we only played two shows. Okay. What kind of uh, sound was Antagonizer? <sighs> It antagonized was more like I don't know how to describe it. Some people said we were more Gorilla Biscuit style. I don't really okay. know, because um, with me, I, I I'm always more of a metal guy. Yeah, sure. So uh, I was playing guitar, and it was really made up mostly of four of the five of us were people that just hung out and yeah. and were good friends at. At, uh, you know, we hung out a lot, like Bond Street and a lot of the other shows. The drummer was my friend who went to art and design because our original drummer ended up having like a, a like a family, like personal crisis and ended up having to leave. So we ended up getting my friend who was more of like a rock drummer. But he was like, eh, you know, I'll give it a shot. And then he was comfortable with it. So he played and we played two shows. uh we told the story on the Billy Club one about uh, the f our first show was also Setback's first show, which was Glenn's band, and they had no singer, and we flipped a coin, and then Setback ended up winning, so Antagonize went on first, Setback went on second, but Setback didn't have a singer, so to this day, I'm still mad at Glenn for that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was... You know, going from the rock band that I had, like that was the first hardcore band that I had that, that had played live. And and we had a group of us that, that were hanging around all the time at Wetlands and all those other clubs. It, it was like, uh, you know, I'm probably going to forget some names, but it was like me, it was Todd from Warzone, it was uh, Martin, yeah. Barry, uh, Warren Lee, who, who became like, you know, tour manager for Slayer, um, and was working with Rancid recently. Um, you know, a couple of other guys, like, you know, a bunch of guys that, that all went in different directions over the years, but a lot of us were always tied in with music. Um, and, and, and Glenn became part of that group also. Um, you know, there there was there, there was a decent sized group of us between between the Bronx guys that used to take the train down all the time, and then there was a group of Westchester guys and and a bunch of other yeah. guys. Um, 
you know, so we had a we had a sizable little group going. Um, I'm trying to think now. From there, uh, I joined a band with some guys from Jersey. I was working at Tower Records, and and this guy had just started working there. Uh, a dude named Rafe, and and Rafe is like, hey, I get this hardcore band, and we're looking for a bass player. And I'm like, okay, I'll check it out. Uh, and it turned out I knew the guitar player because I had met him at shows before. Uh, and that was a band called Distance. And ended up playing with them for a couple of years. Rafe went on to join Kill Your Idols and now plays with Black Anvil. Oh, okay. uh, you know, Rafe and Paul from Black uh, from Kill Your Idols went a totally di different direction going from playing like punk rock to doing black metal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Rafe is a fantastic drummer, so he could pull off with, you know, all kinds of different styles. But I ended up playing a lot with Distance, uh, and that was in like ninety, late ninety six until like middle to the end of ninety eight. Okay, or maybe even the beginning of ninety nine. And we played a lot of shows, and we played Castle Heights, and we played with a lot of the the '90s bands. You know, a lot of them that are still around now. Sure. Because uh, I, I come to know a lot of those bands because it, in that, that Bond Street era doesn't get a lot of doesn't get the credit it deserves because from that that little scene there, you know, that was the first Bulldoze shows uh -huh. in New York. That was the first Twenty Five to Life shows in New York. Uh, Neglect used to come from Long Island and play there, and like VOD and Candiria, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, meeting all those guys in all, all those different directions. Uh, so Distance was playing a decent amount, and then we started arguing a lot about whether we're gonna play shows or we're gonna sit that sit back and write music. And like, I wanted to play shows and kind of try to get the name out there because, again. This was before MySpace or even Friendster or any of that. Like, yeah. the internet wasn't a factor. Like, the only way to get your name out there was to go. Um, and they decided that they were sick of... It was really the guitar player that wanted to, to do that stuff. So, finally, they got sick of us arguing about it all the time, and they decided to cut me loose. Yeah. Um... Which sucked, but in the end, like, they got somebody else out, and it didn't work out, and the whole thing just kind of fizzled out, but the, I've always said I wish we had a chance to record those songs, because those songs, they were more melodic compared to a lot of the other stuff that I was playing. Sure. Because uh, they, we covered, like, Dag Nasty and Minor Threat, which are two bands that, like, not that I'm anti, but I've always been more of a metal guy. So, sure. like, if you ask me who I want to cover, like, those aren't going to be at the top of my list because that's just not the stuff I usually listen to. But it was a mix of, like, that more melodic type of hardcore with some heavier stuff. So it was, you know, but it also came out around the time when everybody was starting to jump on the beatdown thing. So we didn't really fit. Um, but we, you know, we played a bunch of shows and... Uh, I was friends with the Billy Club guys because by that time they had started playing. I went to their second show, not their first show. I didn't go to the first show. And, you know, was regularly friendly with them. Uh, and then after Distance, right around the time that Distance kind of died, I was in a relationship that ended... And, like, we were both, like, seeing people, so I kind of took a break and just stayed away for a little while just yeah. to just to get away from it because it, it was a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, so I reached the point where I wanted to get back in the mix. I put some feelers out with a couple of different people, uh... One dude gets me in touch with Kevin, who was a singer of a band called Five Minute Major. A couple of those dudes had just quit. 
and he was looking to get new guys. Um, and I'm just getting one guy because they went from two guitars to one. One guitar player and the bass player both quit. Yeah. Um, so I ended up joining them on bass. Was playing with them for quite a while. Uh, and if you're wondering how I get to 20 bands, it's because in, in this time, even, you know, from this time on, I, I would be the fill-in guy because the way I learned how to play was all, like, I took lessons here and there, but most of it was ear for me. I see. Like, I would listen to something and, and, and just figure out how to play it. Wow. And I got to be good with that because that's kind of how I really, you know, the lessons were cool, but I, I was more into just, like, let me hear it and let me try to play it. Um, because even from the high school days, I would come home and just sit there and play. So I got the reputation as kind of the filling guy. So I had filled in for a lot of different bands over time. And even at this point, I think we're at five bands. This is before, before Billy Club even, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah. So five minute major playing with them for a while, uh, we put a record out and that was how I taught myself how to do like Photoshop stuff. Like I messed with it a little bit, but like I actually did the, the layout for the CD because, uh, because at the time I was also, I, I, you know, after tower records, I ended up working in other parts of the music business for years. Yeah. And part of it was being like production manager just because I had the experience uh, so like suddenly I'm the one placing the orders for manufacturing CDs and stuff like that. So I had a little bit of experience when it came to that stuff. So when they needed somebody to do the actual artwork, they had the art, but they didn't know how to put it all together. And my girlfriend at the time had one of the first iMacs and, and had like Photoshop and stuff. And, you know, between, between the two of us, we did the whole layout. So that was kind of crazy. Um, ended up playing with them for a while, but then certain people within the band started to not get along and certain people started to be kind of flaky. And like, there was an offer on the table to go to Europe if we write a new record. Yeah. Cause, cause a label from France had put out that one CD. I see. Uh, so that, that offer was on the table from those guys. They were like, hey, if you guys write another record, we'll bring you to Europe. Yeah. And at this point, like, I had done a couple of different bands, but, like, the furthest I traveled, like, distance went to Pennsylvania. You know, we had played all over Jersey and, like, upstate a bit in Pennsylvania, but that, that was as far as we had gone. Sure. And, like, Connecticut. Uh, so the idea of going to Europe was still, like, it was just as much of a fantasy as it was like when I was that kid playing along with it and justice for all. Yeah. Like Europe. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, so eventually it was just dying. Like the idea of writing a new record, like I thought wasn't going to happen because dudes aren't getting along. Like, you know, we couldn't even get together to practice, let alone try to write stuff. Wow. You know, uh, and I, I had always been tight with the Billy Club guys and was talking to them and things weren't working out with their bass player. And I ended up filling in for them one show because, like I said, I was the fill-in guy for a lot of people because I, by that, by that point I had filled in for a bunch of bands like I got up on stage one time with Down Low and did one song on like literally like half hour's notice. Wow. They're like, hey, uh, we want to jump on and do a song. Like, do you know this song? I'm like, kind of like, and I'm down in the, like the downstairs, like right outside the bathroom of CBGB's with, yeah. with Paul. And it's like, okay, oh, three, four. Okay. Yeah. I think I got it. And then like, just jump on. Wow. Um, I did one song with them that time. Uh, the band stepped too far. Okay. Their guitar player broke his hand on like a Friday and Five Minute Major was playing with them on Sunday at Wetlands. And Kevin 
singer of five minute major told Frank, the singer of Step Too Far, was like, yo, I think, I think Motley could do it. Why don't you ask him? So he called me. Like, I literally picked up the CD from him Saturday night, listened to it all night, got a couple of hours sleep, went and played the show, played the set with them, and played the five minute major set. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, and I had done this with other bands, like, uh, Full Blown Chaos one time was playing the Temple in Brooklyn. It was like a big, like, all day festival with a bunch of bands. And, like, uh, I think Five Minute Major played. If they if they didn't play, I was there working security. Yeah. And they're like, hey, we want to we want to jump up and play a couple of songs. We don't have a bass player. And I was like, I can play. So I'm in somebody's car, like, listening to their, like, first EP, like, over and over. And then we go up on stage and the first singer calls out the first song. It's the one song they do that's not on the EP. So I'm just <laughs> <Of course>. like... <laughs> and, and the one guitar player is like, yo, just ride the low string. It's fine. Because <laughs> most of that song was just like low. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, fuck it. You know, stuff like that. So I, I, I was always kind of known as the fill-in guy because I was doing that for a different bands. Um... Friends with the Billy Club guys, they they were talking about playing the show. This was October of 2000. It was actually on my birthday. And I'm like, dude, because they're like, yeah, Matt can't play. We don't know if we're going to play it or not because they weren't getting along with him anyway. And I said, I could play. It's my birthday anyway. I'll try not to get too drunk. <laughs> um, and they're like, all right, let's do it. So we get together and practice. And immediately, it's just like, hmm, this sounds different. Um, we play the show. We go on at like 2 in the morning. Uh, it's very tough to not be really, really drunk at that time. Uh, <laughs> what, what venue was that again? That was at Castle Heights. At Castle Heights, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's definitely video of it. Yeah. Glenn, Glenn has it. I may have it. Um, from there... You know, I was still back with Five Minute Major, still in this weird situation, and eventually, uh, I'm talking to Glenn. Glenn calls me and he's like, listen, we want you to play. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do two bands. Like, yeah. Plus, the, you know, the writing, go to Europe thing. I was still, I was still holding out hope for it. And, uh, and, you know, Glenn had been telling me about the stuff that was going on within the band and things weren't going well. And then finally he's like, listen, we're going to start, we're going to kick him out and we're going to start looking for somebody It's yours if you want it. Uh, but one way or another, like, he's not the guy. Yeah. He, he, it's not working out anymore. And around that time, things were starting to go really south with the other band. And I was like thinking about it and I'm like, hmm. And finally, I was like, you know what? Let me go in and try to do both because I don't have much faith that Five and a Major is going to do much of anything anyway. Because that whole situation was just deteriorating. Like, it was one of those things where I was the only one that got along with everybody. Uh, I see, I see. Uh, you know, which is stressful on its own. Uh, and it was, you know, it wasn't like anybody was a dick or whatever. It was just like everybody had their differences and like it just wasn't. It happens. Um, so finally, Glenn and I are talking, and I'm like, fuck it, I'm in. Uh, so we play, Five Minute Major and Billy Club play together, and it was known that it's Matt's last show. I see. And it, I forget if it was at the show or before, but they told Matt that I was the new guy. Yeah. And he was all, he was nice about it, but it was definitely an awkward situation. And then, like, things were bad with the other band to the point of where Kev is like, oh, he's leaving us for Billy Club. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, he's saying it on stage, and I'm just like, no. Yeah. But it was just, everybody was all weird. So I decided I was going to do both bands for a while, but then Five Minute Major never really did 
anything else. It, it stopped for a while. They eventually wow. started it up again. But uh, I played my first show, first official show as a member of Billy Club. That was in June of 2001. Oh, okay. I see. So. Yeah. Uh, I filled I filled in in October, and then I don't remember I I don't remember if they did other shows with Matt. They probably did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did actually. But the that last show with Matt was probably like March or April. Yeah, and then in June, I was in. We played a show was with E Town Concrete and Sworn Enemy, and I forget who else. And that was at Wetlands. Okay. And that was my first show as an official member of Billy Club. And then from there, we just jumped in. Um, you know, we started talking to different people about doing different things. And eventually, we actually would travel around a bit. And we actually got to go and do the overseas stuff, which was crazy. Because uh, that was one of those things. Like, as a kid, I was, you know. Here I am listening to Made in Japan, like uh -huh. never thinking that I'm actually going to go to Japan no. and play. So that was that was wild. And yeah, in the meantime, like I was also filling in for for other bands. Uh, and then at times I would actually start playing full, uh, not not full time because none of those bands were really like Billy Club was always my priority. But I ended up playing with District Nine for a while. I ended up playing with uh, Mickey's crew for quite a while. Oh, okay. Um, I ended up filling in for a while for a band called State of Disgrace, uh, which were uh, Mike the singer was from the Bronx. So actually, Mike and Danny the drummer were both from the Bronx. Oh, um, okay, okay, okay. State of Disgrace. We told the story about, uh, on the Billy Club one, we told the story about what happened at Club 1680. Yeah, yeah, when, yeah, when yeah. the When the dude, when the bonehead dudes tried to jump Ernie, and yep. we all stepped off the stage. So I was talking to Mike recently, and he reminded me he was playing for a band, and I forgot the name of the band again. Uh, he was singing for a different band, and one of those bonehead dudes was in his band. Oh. Uh, and it was because of that incident that he quit that band. And, and and he he's supposed to reach out to you, so he'll he'll have his own version of the story to tell sure, you. But sure. but it was after that he quit that band. I, I'm spacing out, and I can't for the life of me remember what the name of the band was. Um, but it was another band. It was it was a bunch of dudes from the Bronx. Uh, but because of that incident, and I guess some other like borderline racist shit, he ended up leaving that band. And then he started State of Disgrace, which was him and another dude from the Bronx uh, with a couple of guys from Queens. They, you know, their guy left. He asked me to fill in for a while because I was, I was tight with him. Um, and then that band kind of fell apart. And then he started a new band called All Is One, which was him and, and Danny again. So it was, you know, a couple of guys from the Bronx. And a couple guys from the other boroughs. And then he asked me. I helped them write some songs. I helped them kind of figure some things out. And then I ended up producing their first demo. Because their bass player left. So I was actually playing bass on it. Uh, I had learned the songs to do the tracks. And then when we were in the studio, everything was just a mess. So I ended up kind of just taking charge and suddenly becoming the boss. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and suddenly I was the producer. Uh, cause it's like, well, you guys aren't playing the same thing. Like nobody, cause they just didn't have the experience. They didn't know, like, how are we going to count this off or do this or do that? And I had the experience. So I was like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We'll do yeah. this, this, this. Uh, so I ended up playing with them for a little bit until they found somebody, but I also kind of became their manager. And uh, and was doing that for a bit, and then things went sour. Uh, and it wasn't long after that that Mike ended up leaving that band. But uh, you know, so that that was kind of a messy situation. But I was doing stuff with those guys and with Mickey's crew and, and District Nine, and I was, yeah, I, was just, I was bouncing around doing a bunch of different stuff on the side besides Billy Club. But Billy Club was always my main thing. Um, 
and then I was out of, I ended up getting out of the music business eventually just because the business was a mess. Yeah. Um, you know, and going in other directions with work and, uh, and then Billy Club stopped. Uh, you know, we talked about that a bit and, and Malone and the issues that he was dealing with and Billy Club just kind of hit a wall. Uh, and it was just not a functional band at that point. And then I, I had my own personal stuff going on, you know, with the mother of my kids and stuff like that. So that, that was all a big mess. And I played for a little while with a band called the Gemini Method that was much more of like a technical metal band. Okay. Uh, but it was dudes that had been in hardcore bands, and that's how I knew them. And we recorded like two songs, and I was doing that for a little bit, and then it didn't really, that kind of fizzled out. Um, and then eventually Billy Club came back in the mix. Uh, and, and the Billy Club thing took a while. And, you know, I won't get too deep into it because that, that's more of like a group Billy Club thing. We'll definitely talk about that more. But like the rift in Billy Club, a lot of it was me and Malone. Yeah. Because he had his issues and I could pick up on his issues and he wasn't ready to cop to his issues. I see. I see. Um, you know, but being Glenn and I always handled the business for the band, but a lot of it was me. And I had two young kids. So like here I am changing diapers and stuff and then staying up until like 3 a.m. emailing people about shows just for this dude to not respond to me about are we playing, you know, can we play the show or not? Yeah, yeah. And, and it just got to me and it was just getting really bad and then everything hit the wall. Um, you know, and then we stopped and then it took a long time, you know, from from him sitting down with us and the main thing was me and him having to work out our stuff. Yeah, sure. Because we could go and, and, and do a lot of things, but it's like before you – with the way we are and the way we always were, it's like before we could go and do what we need to do, me and him had to sort out our thing. Because uh, the thing with Billy Club is we were friends from before Billy Club started. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Not even just from before I joined the band. We were friends before Billy Club started, Long period. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, in the very early stages, like, we were already friends. Um, you know, so while I wasn't in the band, I've been there pretty much from the beginning, friends with those guys. And, and seeing them, like I said, from that second show. Um, and we're, we're like family. Yeah. You know, and, and there's a handful of other people, like the irate guys, that, that we... We consider family, but when it comes to the Billy Club guys, like I've spent more time with those guys than I have with members of my own family. Absolutely. So we had a lot of stuff we had to work out. Um, and, and it was a lot, but it, you know, we we managed to get to a much better space, and we started to do stuff again, and and we're very lucky that we've been able to do more. Yeah. Um. And, and you know we're in a weird space now, and we'll we'll see where it goes. But like I said, in the meantime, like I, I filled in here and there, doing other stuff. Like the most recent thing, like I played bass for Enziguri for one show, another Bronx band. Uh, you know, and I've known those guys for a long time. I've known Davey since you know since he was a teenager. Yeah coming to Bronx Underground shows. Um, so, you know, that that's that's kind of the run of, like, what what my life has, has been when it comes to music. Uh, I love it. To me, like, there's nothing in the world that I love more than playing. Uh, and that's why I do the fill-in stuff, because it's not like I want to... You know, I'm not some cloud chaser like, oh, watch me with this band. Watch me. Like, I just love yeah. doing it. You, you, you pick the wrong genres for that, even if you were. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true, too. I'm certainly not doing it for the money, either. That's right. right. Um, but I, I, you know, like, yeah, I play, played on stage with 20 bands, but it's like, I do it because I love it. Yep. I love it. And, and I've always loved have... it from like, from like Horace Mann. Yep. Was like, 
whoa, like this this is the drug because I'm not a religious guy at all. Yeah. I'm very anti-religion, yeah. really. Yeah. But like, this is the closest thing I got to religion because to uh-huh. me, like, this is what, this is where I get my energy from. Um, and it doesn't matter. Like, obviously, with Billy Club, it's a different thing because I've been doing that with these guys. We've been friends for over thirty years. Because God knows, you know, we we told plenty of Martin stories. <laughs> um, but. You know, I've been friends with all of those guys for over 30 years, and we uh, we have been together as a band since I started playing with them in 2001. So you're talking about 23 years now? That's amazing. Like, who does anything for 23 years? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And all over the world, like, to Puerto Rico, to Europe, to Japan, like, uh, it, it's it, it's it's a different type of thing, so it's it's a very... It's family, and I love it. So I, I'm i proud of the stuff that I've been able to do, and I'm proud of what we as a group have been able to do, and I'm, I'm honored by other people that have had faith in me, like giving me like 24 hours notice or less to learn stuff and, and give me that trust to go and, and pull this thing off. Um. You know, because there are some people that be like, yeah, I could do it, I could do it, and then they get up there and... Yep, yep. But I've always been, from when I was young, like, I've always prided myself on, like, this is my thing, this is what I love doing, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And, and it's not just for me, it's because I want to make everybody shine. Because uh, that's what being in a group is all about. You're only You're only as strong as your weakest person. So... I always try to bring everybody up because uh, it's important to me, and I, and I feel like that that's that's the thing that I've always brought to everything that I do because I enjoy it so much. And I never thought when I was a kid sitting there listening to like Van Halen records and like Led Zeppelin and like Metallica, like I never thought I'd be able to do, you know, sit here at fifty years old and and talk about all this crazy shit that I've done. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, because you you would never in a million years, when I was that kid sitting there with the record player, never in a million years did I think I'd be in Japan, like, drinking beer with, like, people from the other side of the world who know my music and who know our history and the things we've done and, like, are sitting there talking to me about this old demo that I recorded, like, 25 years ago. Yeah. So you know, because uh, when I was when I was over there, when uh, when we were in Japan, like one of the one of the guys started talking to me about the old distance demo wow. that was produced by Mike Dijon from Crown of Thorns. And he's asking me, uh, you know, about recording with Dijon. And I'm like, this is insane. I'm on the other side of the world talking about something that I did for like two days back in like 97. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but. Uh, that's that's how important it is to people and I understand because it's important to me because like I have you know when I used to go to metal shows and stuff like that I used to get guitar picks uh-huh, uh-huh. I have a whole collection of guitar picks from shows that's like really cool. like uh, dudes from Sepultura dudes from Anthrax uh, Tony Iommi like I was just at shows as a fan and it's like oh my god there's a guitar pick yeah uh, dime bag um, you know and I still have those and and it's like it's such a cool thing to me. So like the first time we ever actually made our own picks, I was like, oh my god! I, you know, if you told like seventeen year old me that I'd have picks with my name on them, like I don't care that I had to pay for them myself. Yeah, like, who yeah, gives yeah, a yeah, shit? Yeah, like yeah. just just the fact that I can even do this is awesome. So so it's like that. That's you know, those are like the peaks for me. Like it's awesome, and I love doing. It. And, and I've always loved doing it, and like I'll keep doing it until I have to stop. Do you have um, out of all the songs that you've, uh, you know, helped write and play on over the years? Do you have bass lines uh, that you know you're most drawn to or, or proudest of? 
That's a tough question. That's like, what's your favorite kid? <laughs> um, I know, it is a tough question. <laughs> I'll say this simply because, and some people will see it as a cop-out because I can't prove it. <laughs> uh, I talked about how Distance didn't record some of our best stuff. Yeah. Uh, there was a song that Distance had called Eulogy that I've always wanted to record, and I still will find a way to do this somehow because to me... It was probably one of my favorite songs that I've ever been involved in. Uh, and and I don't know how I'll record it because I don't know if everybody in that band will even have any interest in it. But even if I got to do it myself, I'll find a way yeah. because I still have it in my head. I remember every bit of that song. And to me, it was a very melodic thing and, and it was very different in the sense, like, I was always more into metal, but the stuff that those guys were into, like the Dag Nasty and stuff like that, yeah. it, it had this melodic element. And the only way, the best way that I can describe it to you is, because uh, this is the example that I always use. If you listen to Leeway and you listen to Desperate Measures, which is one of my favorite records of all time, uh, the song Stand For has a lot of like moving bass lines and yeah. stuff like that. And, and it was closer to that where like the guitar is doing one thing here, but the bass is like moving around under it. Oh, I see. I and, see. and gives it this different kind of melodic texture to it. And, and that song eulogy was like that. So if I had to pick one, that's the one. Uh, and like I said, yeah, maybe it's a cop out because I can't prove it because <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't exist anywhere. Like there are no recordings of it anywhere. It's only up here. Uh, but one day, hopefully with the participation of the other guys, uh, I would really like to get that thing down and and have it for prosperity. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are plenty of other songs from all the bands that I've been involved in that. that uh, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to start naming them because then sure, sure, somebody's sure. going to be like, oh, you didn't mention our song. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with Billy Club, I had to learn a bunch of stuff when I joined and then we started to be creative and write. The writing thing is always tough because it's a chemistry thing. Yeah. And it's easy. And I've done a lot more of this than writing. It's always easy to just jump in and learn a bunch of songs. Like, That's give right, me a yeah. CD with like 10 songs and I'll learn them. The tough part is not sitting there learning 10 songs. The tough part is sitting around and trying to come up with 10 more songs, Yeah, which has always been difficult. Uh, it's, it's honestly the toughest part. And with some of the bands that I've been in, it's crazy because you'll sit there and write whole songs and then you go back to it and you're like, yeah. Yeah. And then you throw it out. Uh, Cause distance did that a few times. And it, and it was crazy because we always said that, like, the stuff we had was the best of the best because we sat there, worked out whole songs, and they were like, I see. nah. Yeah. Uh, and and I don't, know, I don't know if any of the other bands that have uh, been involved in have, have fully done that. We may have taken – we may have worked out stuff and then chopped it up and put the parts in different songs instead. Yeah. But I don't know if we ever took like whole songs and just threw, threw everything out. Wow. But that, that whole writing process is really the toughest part. Yeah. Because um, it's tough to be creative. Like I was talking about how I'm not like a visual arts creative guy at all. Like when you're creative, you got to just like you're throwing, you know, you're throwing your bare ass out there. Yeah. And sometimes it's like. You know, you may think it's the best thing in the world, and then they're like, mm, "Yeah, yeah, yep." Yeah. And 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 you have to kind of have a thick skin with it because otherwise you're going to get all sensitive about it, and it's just not that that's not going to help things because right. it, it's just it's it's a weird process, but that's that's part of the game, and that's that's why it's so tough. Like I said, for me, it's been easy jump in this band, like learn these songs, jump in this band, learn these songs, but like. It's much harder, and that's why I've probably done just as much filling stuff as I have as like a member of the band. Sure. Uh, because when you're, you know, even bands that I've been like a member of, 
only a fraction of them have actually I, we've collaborated on working on new materials. Sure, sure. Because uh, it, it's it's a tough thing. Uh, and like I said, to me, and I'm not the only one because I know we had this discussion at Billy Club practice recently. That like, I know Glenn hates it too. Uh, the the creative part is the most difficult part. Playing shows, to me, easy. Yep. You know, booking shows even easy. Like the business stuff to me is easy because I've I've been in it since early on, like working for labels and and working at record stores and stuff like that. Like that business side to me, I I I have no problem with even as it's evolved over the years because the music business now is completely different. But the toughest part is is sitting down and trying to be creative because, and I, and I say this to a few people and it's true, there's only twelve notes. Yep. There's only 12 notes. No matter how you put it together, somebody else has probably done it before. So how do you make it stand out? Yep. Um, it's hard. But it, it, it's it's part of the game. And, and it's probably, like I said, the most difficult part of it. So uh, I'm going to ask you, you know, a question that's always fun to hear people's answers to because they're just so different um and then we can see if there's there's more you'd like to add to uh but do you think that there's a bronx hardcore or a bronx metal sound or attitude sometimes people will say or you know anything along those lines and, and how would you describe it if you think there is it's tough to say because and and it goes with like I hate subgenres anyway because then yep. you're either like, what's deathcore or what's this or what's that, and you can always trace it back and like somebody else did it before. It was called deathcore. Yep. Um, but you it, you could just look at the gamut of the different bands. Like, irate doesn't sound anything like Fahrenheit. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Billy Club doesn't sound like Enziguri. Um, District 9 doesn't sound like State of Disgrace. Uh, you, you've got a wide range of different types of bands all coming from the Bronx. Um, I think one thing you can look at is the diversity side of it because you've got guys from that are different nationalities, different backgrounds all coming together. Yeah. Uh, you get guys that grew up in the projects mm -hmm. like Martin. Uh, you get guys that grew up in an Italian neighborhood like me. Yeah. Uh, you get guys that grew up in Co-op City or Pelham Parkway or the Concourse. It, it, it's all over the place. Um, the one thing that I can say that, that kind of is a common thread through a lot of it is the hip hop influence. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, that's just something that's in, it's in the DNA. It's in the blood because for, for our age group, Growing up in the Bronx, it's like that was like you couldn't get away from. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Because hip hop started, you know, there's always the argument of did it start in the Bronx, uh, which I think it did. Um, but it's in our blood because it, it evolved as we did, and it was all around us. Especially if you were living, especially if you were living in an urban area like the projects or the concourse, but even if you weren't. Um, because when when I was going to Lehman College, all those guys were listening to freestyle. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I can't do freestyle. <laughs> it's one of the, one of the, like I can listen to a lot of different types of music. Freestyle is it's not not my thing. Yeah. Um. But you couldn't get away from it, and in the same way as we're growing up in the Bronx. You couldn't get away from hip hop. Uh -huh. uh, there's plenty of people in the Bronx who never heard 
metal because it wasn't as common. Sure. But you couldn't go around the Bronx without hearing like hip hop, dance music in general, but especially hip hop, especially cl- the classic rap stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and I'm not going to go on an old man rant about how the stuff is nowadays. And, uh, there's, all, there's just mumble, and, uh, <laughs> you know, but that's a big part of the DNA there. Whether you listen to Martin yep. or whether you listen to Mike, District 9, or whether you listen to Armando from Fahrenheit, or whether you listen to Phil Vibbs, <laughs> uh, if you if you listen to Irate, um, totally different styles all around, yep. but that's there and... The groove is part of it too. Yeah, sure, sure. When sure. it comes to the music, you you have that hip hop element. Even even if it's more of like a death metal style or something, it's still got that rhythmic style that comes more from hip hop a lot. Um, but also when it comes to the music, there's an element of groove that maybe you don't get in a lot of other places. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Even though, like, on the surface, it's it may be completely different styles, but if if you want to sit there and really break it down to the basic elements, it, it's the rhythms. Yeah. It's it's the rhythms of the vocal delivery and it's, and it's the groove that's, that's in the music. Even if it's fast, it's still there. Yeah. So the other part when it comes to the the hip hop influence is the realness of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not like metal bands wearing leather and and this and that. Like hardcore and hip hop have that thing in common where it's just they're just wearing street clothes. Yep. You know, you're not you're not going out there in like crazy leather outfits or or, you know, coordinated stage clothing or whatever. Uh, so so that's part of it, too. It's not necessarily in the sound itself, but it's in the DNA of it where where it's got that realness where these guys are just up there in street clothes telling stories about, in a lot of cases, they're telling stories about the streets. Like, that's right. Like, you know, they're, they're telling life stories. Uh much like hip hop, like they're not singing about dragons. They're not singing about like crazy shit. And, and in some cases, and, and we've tried with, with Billy club to tell stories at times. And that's something that I've talked to Martin about a lot, because if you listen to stuff like NWA, uh-huh. they're just telling stories, ghetto boys, they're telling stories that's about right. the streets and stuff that, that goes on in the streets. Uh, and, and you can go in different directions, but you're telling real stories. You're not telling, you're not talking about fantasies. You're not talking about other worlds and, and other things. And that comes across in the image as well. Because if you look at most hardcore bands, it's like, they're just in street clothes, like baggy street clothes. Like they're not wearing like costumes. That's right. Yeah. So, so that's a big part of it. And like I said, it's not necessarily in the sound. But it's in the DNA and, and it's in the image and it's it, it's in just the feel of it. Yeah. Uh, so it makes it a little more real as as compared to some of the more fantasy type stuff or just other random stuff or stuff that really doesn't talk about anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, sure. You know, it's a big difference from like Molly Percocet. <laughs> um, so so that's that's part of. And with with the Bronx thing, it's like, yeah, you got some of the, some of these people that live in other parts of the country or the world or whatever, talking about street shit when they're not yeah. living it. Uh, even at its best, the Bronx can be hood sometimes. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, like uh, Mars Park's a nice area, but I, I can't tell you I've never seen anybody. I, I've never seen somebody get jumped. Of course I have. Yeah. Uh, and I've been around the concourse, and I've been around different areas, and I've I've seen all kinds of shit. Uh, you know, seen dudes shooting guns and stuff. It's it's 
it's the urban thing. A lot of cities are like that because I'm sure in Detroit, there's plenty of that shit. Yep. Chicago, there's plenty of that shit. So it's, it's just, it's urban life. So that's all part of it also. Um, and, and that's something that stands out because, you know, people have this image of the Bronx, which isn't always a real thing because, uh, my friend Yuri from Belgium came and stayed with me one time in the Bronx and he's just standing in front of my building and he's like, this isn't what it looks like in the movies. <laughs> and, and it's like, you know, it, it, not everything in the Bronx is Fort Apache or the fucking Warriors. That's right, okay. That's right. Um, sure. Some of it is grimy. You know, some of it is hookers at the point, yep. <laughs> but you know, some of it is, is just fine. Like Mars Park overall is a nice neighborhood. There's plenty of nice neighborhoods in the Bronx. Yep. Riverdale's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, just like plenty of parts of Queens and Brooklyn are like that too. Uh, you know, so, so some of it is just the image of the Bronx being scary, but I would say none of us have ever really played that up. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, you know, it's never been a gimmick. We yep. just do our thing. And, and whether it's guys who grew up in the projects or, or guys who grew up in nicer neighborhoods, you know, uh, I've never seen anybody from the Bronx trying to fake it. Yep. And, and that's something to, to keep in mind also. So when it comes down to it, like if you want to talk about like a Bronx sound or whatever, it's really that groove there's a hip hop influence there and, and just trying to be street level on it, you yeah. know, yeah. not, not trying to go in crazy directions and, and, and be silly with it and just, you know, I hate, I hate the term, but it's like, for lack of a better term, to keep it real. Yeah, sure, sure. That's what it comes down to. Sure. Um, so are there, are there other things you'd like to add that we haven't, uh, touched on? Um, no, that's that's pretty much it. I just would like to say, you know, doing this with the Bronx Historical Society is an absolute honor for me. I am born and raised in the Bronx. The Bronx is in my DNA. Uh, and I everywhere I go, I've always represented the Bronx as number one, because to me, that's that's where I'm from. Uh, you know, I'm big into pro wrestling and. Bobby the Brain Heenan is one of my favorite managers of all time. And he said something in an interview once that, that stuck with me. And he said, listen, people talk a lot about the wrestling business and say a lot of negative things. But but the wrestling business is gave me everything I have. Yeah. So for me, I think of it the way he said it. It's like, for me, I the Bronx is how I learned just about everything I know. Yeah. From the time I was a kid to, to growing into being a man. Uh, and, and hardcore is the same way. I learned a lot through hardcore. Uh, I made some of my best friends and my worst enemies through hardcore <laughs> music. And, and, and all, most of my life lessons came from music and from the Bronx. So to, to be asked to do this and, and to be recognized as an artist from the Bronx and to be able to talk about my experience growing up in the Bronx and living, you know, 50 years in the Bronx in one way or another, because even if I was living somewhere, the Bronx is in me. Uh, and, and, and the Bronx will always be in me, no matter what. Uh, I can't think of anything better than to see that recognized. And it's an honor for me to be a part of it and, and to see myself, but also my friends. Yeah. Uh, some of, you know, some of my best friends in the world have, have been involved in this project and, and it's amazing to see that recognition and, and it, it's, it's touching to me because like I said, the Bronx has always been number one inside of me. 
and I can't think of anything better. And to be able to talk about both of those things that are my favorite things in the world and, and that are the majority of my DNA, the Bronx and, and music and especially heavy music and hardcore music and to see that recognized and to be able to, to talk about it and to kind of tell my story and, and to tell our story, uh, there's nothing better. And, and, and I thank you for that. Hey, my pleasure. And, and just as an added thing, Mutley's the one who, who actually came up with the name of the project. There, there <laughs> were pre previous names. They were works in progress, but, uh, but Mutley's to thank for that. So thank you. Yeah. For that. Uh, and, and that was just off the top of the head, but it worked out perfectly. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of it because we've worked on a few different things related to this project and trying to get some people together. Uh, and, and it's an absolute honor to be part of this thing. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops over time, uh, as we get more and more people involved. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.